morning, if you have your Bible, would you turn to Proverbs chapter 6? So good to see each of you here today. We have been, if you're a guest with us, we have been starting a series called Sin. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 6, we've been starting, or started last week a series called Sin. And last week we looked at the fact that Solomon mentions seven things that God considers an abomination that he hates. And the root or the reason for this list is not that it's all inclusive of every sin that people could commit by any means, but the list gives us great insight into the root of where all of our sin comes from. It gives us a a picture of our heart when we see these problems reflected in our outward life. So I'd like to take a moment and look at the subject of sin today and look at the second one that he listed. Last week it was a proud look. Today he talks about the lying lips. So would you read with me in Proverbs 6, beginning in verse 16, down through verse 19. These six things does the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. And heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaks lies, and he that sows discord among the brethren. Now, if you'll notice this morning before we go into the message, notice that he mentions here the subject of lying twice. At the beginning of verse 19, he says a false witness that speaks lies. But then in the second one in verse 17, the second one in this list of seven, he says, a lying tongue. What in the world is Solomon giving this to us for at this particular time? Well, let's talk about that today. But before we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we love you so much. And we know, Lord, that our life is riddled with all the effects of our sinful flesh nature. Remind us as believers today of what you desire to do in us, how you desire to reflect the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ through each of our lives, that we might be able to be a witness. Lord, forgive us of all the things that we often even forget that we do that besparts your name and bring disgrace to the cause of Christ. Forgive us, Lord. And Lord, as we look at our lives today, may we be challenged by your word to see things from your perspective. And as we look at our life, may we say, wow, this is why this is happening. It's because way down here deep, I've got this whole attitude, this whole desire, this whole sinful belief in my life and my heart, this characteristic. Lord, I know today that there are people here from all walks of life, and somebody may very well not know the Lord as Savior. Lord, I pray that today, as your word is spoken, that Holy Spirit would do his miraculous work, and he would meet with those folks, and he would convict them and draw them and remind them of their sin and then the great love that you have and that they might turn to you today is our prayer father we also thank you so much that we'll get to celebrate in baptism here in a little while and rejoice with those who have trusted christ and named him as savior father i ask as we go through this service that you'd speak to us you'd challenge us and remind us of all you've done for us and want to do through us in jesus name we pray amen So I mentioned last week that this is not necessarily an easy series because, you know, in order for a preacher to preach the message, he also has to preach it to himself while he's putting it together. And so sometimes the challenges of our lives or my life um, often are reflected in the sermon. And I think that's rightly so for when you see biblical authors, they have the same kind of concept as they write. So let's think for a moment about what it is that Solomon is giving us here when he says a proud look and then he follows that up this week with a lying tongue. Well, a lying tongue is one that speaks falsehood knowingly and willingly with an intention to deceive others. Lying can be used to impugn the character of a brother or the flatter of a friend, and it's most detestable evil to God because God is a God of truth. He is a God without error. In fact, the Bible even says in the book of Hebrews that it is impossible for God to lie. So for God to list this lying tongue here is no surprise to us because as a holy God, he detests those who intentionally deceive. Now I want to look for just a moment at the author, and I called this sermon the saga of sin and the saga of lies because really all of human history, the main, one of the main problems that has been here is the 
idea of lie. Not believing, not portraying, not telling the truth. A lie has been around since the Garden of Eden. And we're going to read about that with me, Lord willing, here in just a few minutes. But I'd like for us to look, first of all, at where lies come from. Well, the author of the saga of lies is nothing more than Satan himself. Remember what the Lord Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 44? He said to the Pharisees, the religious people who, who, who literally lied to the folks, he said, you are the father of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. You and I need to understand that Satan does not have our best interest in mind, and he is the ultimate deceiver, and he is so crafty, and he is so skilled at the lies and the deception that he tells. And you and I can often fall into that same trap of, of lying or believing a lie. And that is uh, the very characteristic that Solomon points out here about focusing and listening and knowing that what you say and what you do is speaking the truth. So let's talk about that for just a moment. You may remember the Ten Commandments. How many of you ever heard of them? Say amen. amen. Just making sure you're awake today. The Ten Commandments, you may know, <laughs> Exodus chapter 20. One of the Ten Commandments that the Lord provides to Moses is, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. False witness we're going to get to in a later series, but the whole idea is that we shall not lie. The idea here is that we should reflect as a Christian the character of our truth-loving Savior who is incapable of lying, and so we should also reflect that. Now, if... Jesus told the Pharisees that because of the lies they told, they reflected their father who was Satan. How much more should we also understand that we should not be speaking lies? For in fact, we represent the Lord Jesus Christ and he is our heavenly father. Amen. So the Bible tells us in the book of Colossians 3, 9 and 10 that as believers, we need to take this seriously. He said, lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. You used to be the child of Satan. Now you're a child of God. And he says, and then put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him, after the image of him that created him. You and I need to remember this today. First of all, number one, if you're born again, you're a child of the king and you've been born into the family of God and that can never be undone. Amen. Amen. If you're truly saved, you can never be uh, cut off from the family of God. But there are a lot of folks today that they're kind of on the, 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 the crest of this because they have maybe have made a profession of faith in a church and they walk down an aisle and they maybe prayed a prayer at an altar or they were baptized or they were added to some church role. But there was never a change that took place in their heart. And these are the fake folks I, I fear the most for, for they think they're all right with God, but they're really far from Him. They have a religious mindset like the Pharisees did, but they have no relationship relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Solomon gives us this list, and a wonderful list it is because it confronts the very core of our character and says, where are you at with the Lord? And who is your father? Because who your father is going to be reflected on how you live and how you talk and your walk every day. There may be somebody here who has never professed Christ as your Savior. I want you to know today that you're still a child of Satan. You're still part of the, your Satan is your father, so to speak. You are trapped in the deception of being lost, thinking that you're okay. You are in, in, in a condition that the Bible says you're already condemned. And you need the hope and the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. The author of the saga of lies is Satan. And you say, well, how did you get that? Well, anybody know what the word saga means? Why well, I might have picked that. Anybody want to? Huh? ongoing story. Anybody ever met someone and their whole life is like an ongoing saga? And I don't mean that in a positive way. Oh my goodness. One drama after another. One catastrophe after another. One incident after. And it, I mean, all of us live a life that's a saga, but some people it's just a little more exaggerated. You know what I mean? Well, of all of the th stories in the Bible, the one that carries itself through from the Garden of Eden all the way to the cross and then even to our day and age today, what it is this saga of the lies and the deception of Satan. But I have good news to tell you today before I continue any farther in the verse. One day Satan's going to be uh, meet his match, so to speak. He was defeated at Calvary and he is going to be absolutely destroyed one day. The Bible says that Satan and death and hell and the Antichrist and all those will be cast into the lake of fire and will be rid of them forevermore. There will be no more Satan and no more lies. But you and I know that he's still here. And he is on a very, very uh, powerful adversary 
necessary, and he's very, very tricky. And so let's look at what he did to Eve back in, in Adam, back in the Garden of Eden, and turn over with me for a moment to this beginning of the saga of lies in Genesis chapter 3. There's five quick little things I want you to notice about what happened in this story, this account of when Adam and Eve were innocent. They were enjoying the beauty of the presence of the Lord, the beauty of his creation. It was absolutely perfect. There was no fault in it. God looked at it every day when he created it and said, this is good. And now suddenly Satan enters the picture. You say, well, how did Satan get in the Garden of Eden if the Garden of Eden was perfect? That's a great question. The Bible tells us that long before creation of the world, there was an event that happened in heaven. And you can read about this over in the book of Ezekiel and a couple other places. But that Satan himself decided to rebel against God. He exalted exalted himself as wanted to exalt himself as though he was God and God says I am the Lord I am the only one and you're not going to do that and he expelled him and Satan was so tricky in fact Satan was the music leader they say of heaven he was very beautiful among all the angels uh, just a little plug there for Patrick but I'm just teasing <laughs> and and he didn't know what to think about that. He really was the, the one who gathered all the angels together, and he thought that he should get more of the attention than Almighty God himself. Long story short, he deceived about a third of the angels, and they all were cast from heaven, and the angels that we know that are fallen are now called demons, and demons are very much real. And so all of a sudden we find that this whole group is cast from, from heaven, and yet they are not destroyed. They are still here. And, and Satan had a, a mission, and that was to get every person that he could to, to sin against the Lord. Lord and to bring harm to the glory of God and, and to betray his holiness and to be a deceiver um, of folks from the truth. And he continues in that work to this day. But I want you to know something, friend. It all began, the saga began in the Garden of Eden. There's some great truths that you and I can take from what happened to Adam and Eve and apply them to our life and really learn a lot about how to deal with this idea of being deceived or being a deceiver. Now, I, I need to tell you that when we talk about deception, we could talk about several things. One thing could be this out-and-out -out lie, just a lie. We all know what those are. And then, with, you know, some people in our society, they've kind of got morally correct now, so they say, well, there's a lie, and then there's a white lie. Anybody ever heard of that? Well, if there's a white lie, then where's the black lie? And where's the gray lie? I don't understand that. A lie is a lie, amen? <laughs> now, some people say, well, you know, sometimes you might need to lie to help someone feel better. I have never, ever in my life understood that. If you can't say something that's going to make somebody feel better that's the truth, then don't say anything. Don't tell a lie. Don't tell a lie. Don't be a deceiver. But the one that really gets this is exaggeration. All the fishermen just hung, up, hung their head in shame. <laughs> All the deer hunters hung their head in shame. Man, I saw that buck, and boy, his, his antlers was way out to here, right, Toby? <laughs> way out here. Oh, boy, that fish I caught, he was really this big, but by the time you tell the story, he's this big. And, and, but, you know, we pick on the hunters and the fishermen because that's an easy thing to do. But more dangerous is when something happens and people in the church make it more out, out more to be than it really was or is. Satan will use that. Somebody will just say something off the cuff, and boy, somebody will take those words, and Satan will begin to deal with those in their heart, and it will become a big, blown-up drama and mess, that all because Satan got into it, and we allowed him to do so as Christians. We need to be very careful about that. Making a mountain, so to speak, out of a molehill, Satan is the ultimate deceiver that will cause us and insinuate us to exaggerate with almost without even realizing it. So let's look for a moment at Genesis 3 and verse number 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And the serpent here, representative of Satan himself. And it says that he said unto the woman, Yeah, have God said, you shall not eat of the tree of the garden. The saga begins with doubting God's word. Anytime that you face sin in your life, it comes from the deception and the temptation of Satan. That sin begins with a doubting of God and his word. It really does. Think about something that you struggle with in your life, and all of us have something. We usually try to make some kind of justification to overpower in our mind or justify in our mind why we are wanting to sin or why we're going to sin and why we did. The saga begins with doubting God. And notice you can't really without reading it carefully, get the sarcasm and the underlying deception of what Satan has to say in this verse to Eve. Notice he says, So has God really told you not to eat of every tree of the garden? 
You can almost hear it in the, in the language that is used. Has God really told you that you can't eat a, every tree in the garden? Surely that can't be right. He carries with it the connotation that God didn't know what he was saying when he gave them this commandment. He carries with it the idea that God can't really be trusted because God has his own agenda and he's not really looking out for you. Satan has that very, very tightly packaged in a great deception for most people. That what God says you can't be a part of and God says you don't need to do was really said for your benefit. It really was. But Satan has a way of twisting it around that God is withholding some pleasure from you. That God is withholding some experience beyond imagination from you. And he always makes that doubt present before we sin. Doubting what God has said. Well, maybe God really didn't mean that. He may bring the excuse. He plants those seeds. The second thing that he does is found here in verses 2 and 3. Read with me. As we look at the saga continues, the story continues with the distorting of God's word. Not only does he get us to doubt it, but to distort it. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. What does Satan do after he gets us to doubt and trust the Lord? Well, then he knows if we're any kind of a Christian that we've been in the Bible and we have some truth there that's been hidden in our heart, as the Bible says, he then gets us to kind of twist it around and distort it. Anybody ever been there before? You hear a verse or you're given a verse and it's just kind of twisted around to justify whatever it is that people are doing. One of the most famous ones in our culture today is where Jesus said, Judge not that you be not judged. How many have ever heard somebody say that, even a lost person? And they try to twist that and judge and turn that around on us and say well if you call out anything as wrong or you call out anything as sin well you're judging me that's the bible says you're not supposed to judge well it does say that but it also says that christians are to be very aware and discern what's going on around them and if an apple tree is not producing any fruit, then there's something wrong with the apple tree. So if the Christian's not producing any fruit, then there's probably something somewhere wrong with the tree. That's not judging, friend. That's just a plain and simple fact. Or if you've got an orange tree that's producing apples, something's really messed up. <laughs> and there's a few people that are Christians today that claim to be Christians that the fruit that they bear is the fruit of evil instead of the fruit of righteousness. So don't give me this twisted around scripture, judge not that you be not judged. Read the rest of the chapter, friend, and you'll find that he is telling people not to stand in judgment as if you're better than somebody else, which is what we talked about last week with the proud look. But he certainly gives every Christian the right and responsibility to look at what's going on around them and to observe and evaluate the facts. Now, if you're today caught in some sort of sin and, and I maybe mention that to you and, and somehow you think that I'm judging you, the, uh, the proper respect is this. I'm not judging you or should not be judging you and neither should a person judge you, so to speak. But I want you to understand this. It is our job as Christians to confront one another and encourage one another. I heard a preacher one time preach a sermon, don't mind your own business. That was a good one. I think a lot of people, though, have taken it the wrong way. The saga continues with distorting God's word. And even Eve here, she kind of, if you read in chapter 2 um, over here, it's about verse 16 and 17, the Lord God said, uh, commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat. Notice that when Eve tells Satan what she's not supposed to do, she just said some tree in the middle of the garden. She does not say, and I think it's intentional, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I think that she left that part out on purpose because she's trying to justify what she knows she's about to do, which is go pick some fruit from that tree and eat it. And isn't it interesting that a lot of times we'll be uh, the same character. We'll have a doubt about what God really meant or a doubt about God's intentions for us, even though really deep down we should know that because we trusted him with our soul. And now suddenly we come to this temptation that we're at. And so we distort God's word slightly just so we can justify whatever it is that we're continuing or starting to do. C.F. Keel wrote a commentary, and I have one at my house, and I would like to read to you what he says about this topic. 
The tempter exaggerates the prohibition of God in the hope of exciting in the woman's mind both distrust of God himself and doubt as to the truth of his word. Can I just stop there and say what is going on in our culture today? There is a plain out and out distrust of God, not only because what people have seen in God's people, but also what people have been deceived about by, by Satan. And the first tactic of any godless society that we look at in history is not only do they have a distrust of of God, but then they also have a rejection of God's word. We can go back and look at Israel, and we can also look in the United States. When we have God's word thrown out, it means that we don't trust what God has had to say, and we open the door for Satan to come in with all kinds of deceptions. Then we keep reading, and or I keep reading, and notice it says, he says, she was aware of the prohibition and fully understood its meaning, but she added, nor shall you touch it. She also added that, by the way, distorted it to the word and proved by this very exaggeration that it appeared to too strident even for her, and therefore that her love and confidence towards God was already beginning to waver. Here was the beginning of her fall, for doubt is the father of all sin, and disbelief the mother of all transgression, and the doubt and the disbelief were all deceptions from Satan, the father of lies. Secondly, not only does the saga continue with distorting God's word, but thirdly, I want you to notice this, the saga requires denial of God's word. Requires denial of God's word. Look, if you would, please, back at number, chapter number 3, verses 4 and 5. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. Directly contrary to what God has just said. So if Satan has gotten you to doubt the trusting in the loving hand of God just a little bit, now he's got you to rearrange and distort God's word. Now he has the opportunity to come in and just feed you an out and out lie and you're already in the position to receive it. Now, this is something that happens with sin, but it's also something that happens in churches with the truth of the gospel. Somebody was talking to me the other day, and they were wondering, and they were asking me, why is it that there are so many different religions, and why are there so many different Christian churches? And, and I'll tell you why. There's one answer to that. Satan. 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 Because we have but one God. Amen? Amen. We have but one Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We have but one holy, inspired, infallible word of God. Amen. So where's the problem? The problem is that Satan has taken this word and people have taken it in their mind. He has used it in their mind and twisted it around and distorted it, exaggerated it and deceived. And so people get hung up on one phrase or one clause and, and throw out the rest. And that is exactly what he wants to do, wants to do to churches. And so notice what Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times, and by the way, you and I live in latter times. Amen. Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. In other words, those demons we mentioned earlier that were cast with Satan from heaven, those are seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And he says, beware, because they're going to speak lies in hypocrisy. Notice I underlined that in red. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be deceived with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Notice that he just mentions, Paul or does to Timothy, that there's going to come along some people, and they're going to major on the minor and in majoring on the minor of scripture they're going to miss the whole beautiful story of the love and the grace of God and I want to tell you today that there are a lot of Baptists that fall into this trap can I just preach for a minute Okay, we get hung up on how many tattoos somebody's got, how long their dress is. We get all hung up about where they were yesterday and where they were the day before. And I agree, all of those things are probably sin and shouldn't be in someone's life. But if they don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, bless God, they don't know any better. And our job is to preach to them the gospel of the truth, of the word of God, and to see them come to know Jesus Christ as Savior is the most wonderful experience we can ever observe. We catch them, so to speak, and let God do the cleaning through the Holy Spirit in their life. It's not my job to stand up here with a legalistic list and cram it down your throat. It's my job to preach the word of the Lord Jesus Christ, to exalt him and him alone. And I want you to know today, when you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and he saves you, there's a change that takes place in your life that is indescribable, and it will cause us to reflect and to look on where we are, and we'll notice that whether or not these sins are apparent in our life. Now, the saga requires denial of God's word. The serpent said to the woman, he says, you shall not surely die. Satan calls God a liar. 
That's really what he does. Satan calls God a liar. And some of us are so foolish and so stupid that we think that we, can, we would rather believe Satan's lie than believe the truth of the Almighty who loves us and gave his son to be our propitiation, a sacrifice for us. Satan calls God an outright liar. But the saga continues to progress. Look with me, if you would, at verse number 5 again. The saga progresses by disparaging God's character. Look at what happens in verse 5. For God does know, Satan says, as he twists the scripture a little more, for God does know in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Here is his ultimate deception. You see, he's got Eve to doubt God's character and his trusting hand. Then he's got Eve to doubt what God had to say and say, well, I don't know if he really meant that or not. Then he's got a whole distortion of what God has said. And now we come to the point where he has progressed to disparage the very character of God. Notice what he says. Eve, God doesn't want you to eat of that fruit, Satan says. God doesn't want you to eat of that fruit because he knows if you eat it, you're going to be as smart as God. He knows if you eat it, you're going to have all knowledge of good and of evil. He knows if you eat it, you're going to be like him and be as God's. And so in her ignorance, in Adam's too, she decides to listen. Hmm. Does anybody see a trend here that sounds familiar in our culture today? Doubt the trust and the love of the existence of God. Have a disdain for his word. Distort his word that we do have and twist it around for personal benefit and now we have a disparaging of the character of God how many times have we had news flashes or so to speak on the news and how many times on programs even that would normally be somewhat innocent like National Geographic Discovery Channel have we had people come up with all of this heresy about how Jesus had an affair with Mary Magdalene or about how Jesus had an inappropriate relationship with with John and and with James and and we go on and on and on about all of these people that have come up with all of this terrible stuff about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ well listen friend we shouldn't be shocked Because there's somebody behind all of that. And it's our enemy, Satan, that old deceiver. And the Bible says one day he's going to get it right between the eyes. Amen. And we're going to be rid of him. But until then, we got to be aware of his devices. We cannot be ignorant of how he deceives us. We cannot be ignorant and fall into the trap of deception and lies. Because we know who's in control of our life when we're a person who is lying for the intent of deception. Then, not only does he disparage God's character, but lastly... The saga concludes, the novel kind of comes to an end in this chapter because the saga concludes with Eve disobeying God's word. Look at verse number 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes. Now, Satan appealed to her tummy and to her eyesight. By the way, there's a lot of things that can go on there. Physical need and pleasure to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. There's another one that he can appeal to wisdom and claim that you got all kind of smarts when you really don't know anything. Keeping moving, he says then, she took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. The saga concludes when she disobeyed God's word. Satan has brought her full circle from living in innocence and total bliss and joy in the Garden of Eden there where she walked with God in the midst and the cool of the day. Can you imagine, Brother Ron, what that was like to walk out in the garden with the Lord there by the side? My goodness, I think it's just a little picture of what heaven must be like. But in her sin nature and in her vulnerable, frail self, she was deceived full circle by Satan to distrust the Lord, to distrust his word, to distort his word and to believe the disparaging lie he said about God's character So now she's at the point that she has disobeyed and all of that joy and all of that peace and all of that blessing from the presence of the Lord has now ended because Satan has got his victory in deception. Do you see why Solomon says so much that God absolutely hates deception and lying? Because it robs us of the truth and the joy that we should be presenting and should be evident in our lives. God hates for us, friend, God hates for us to be in a miserable condition. Did you know that? And I'm not talking about somebody that's lost everything in a storm 
some of those people, they say, well, I'm still here and I still got my family. I'm still joyful. That's, that's not what I'm talking about, people in that kind of condition. I'm talking about people who have allowed sin and whatever it was, maybe it's their adultery, maybe it's their drunkenness, maybe it's their pornography, maybe it's their drug abuse, maybe it's their alcoholism, you name whatever it is, it, you name it, and suddenly they are miserable in a miserable state. God cannot stand for his people to be trapped in such. And there is a way out. But we need to be very mindful of the fact that Satan, our deceiver, wants to trap us in that mindset. When we look at what he says here, he says, The woman saw and the woman noticed that the tree was good for food. It was pleasant for the eyes and the desired to make one wise. All of those temptations were lined up there for her. I don't know if you've read the book of James before, but in James chapter number one, if you, it probably is on your paper. It might not be. I can't remember. But in James chapter 1, he gives us a whole description of how we come to sin as people of God. Notice he says this. Let no man say to you when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. God is not the one dangling the booze in front of the sinner. God is not the one dangling the pornography on your phone. God is not the one doing all of that. It is from our arch enemy the deceiver Satan. Then notice that he says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. What happened to Eve? She saw that it looked good. She saw that it was going to taste good. She thought she'd get smarter in the process, and she says, I'm going to eat this fruit. She was drawn away of her own lust, and she doubted the Lord, and she doubted his word, and then she partakes of it. And then notice what James goes on to say, drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Now, yes, all of us today are living in a fallen world, and all of us today are going to face death. Death, is, death has passed to all men because all have sinned. Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, and their genetics are in all of us, friend. We got it honestly. We really did. And, and we passed it down from generation to generation, and we're all going to face death because we live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen world. Death is a separation. The separation for Adam and Eve is they were expelled from the presence of God in the garden. God even put up cherubims as guards to keep anybody from ever coming back. They were expelled from his presence. They were still allowed to live, but they didn't live the same joyous life that they used to. Every time you get bit by a mosquito or poked by a thorn, blame Eve. She's the fault of it all. Y'all are still sleeping. But really, it's not just Eve we should blame, nor is it Adam, for we also willingly sinned. We live in a fallen world, and our arch enemy Satan is out there to deceive us. And when we begin to be a person who speaks things that are untrue, and makes it a habit in our life where we're a perpetual liar, we need to have a checkup in our heart because something's wrong, friend, because we're reflecting Satan. We're not reflecting the truth of Christ. Next time Satan comes along to tempt you to, to lie about something and make yourself look a little better than you really are, just remember where he came from and where his end is. Next time he comes to you and wants you to spread some gossip and elaborate on a little bit to make it sound even better than the previous person that told you about it, check it do a little checkup about the deception that Satan has you in. We need to be careful because our Satan, or the Bible says our Savior, has given us the truth. But Satan is the father of those lies. One of the most dangerous ones that I'll mention before we close this morning is this. One of the reasons that people come and hear the truth and then leave and never receive Christ as Savior is they are deceived by Satan that, number one, they're okay. They're okay. And there's a lot of guests here today. I want to say something to you. If you've never given your life to Christ, you are not okay. You are not okay. The Bible says all of us and all of humanity, all seven billion and something of us, we're all sinners and we fall short of God's glory. And we will never, ever be okay to get into heaven until we repent of our sin and have our faith placed in the Lord Jesus Christ and ask Amen. him to save us. That will never occur for you. Do not be deceived. If you are to die at this moment lost, you would be forever in eternity in hell. And the offer of salvation was given to you not only this morning right now, but it has been several times in your life from our Lord and Savior who died on the cross and offered salvation to all of us. Second of all, not only will Satan deceive you into thinking you're okay, he might 
realize that you're convinced you need to be saved, but then you might be that person that he then deceives to say, well, don't do it yet. Just wait. Just wait. And in that great deception, he says, you know you need to get right. I, I get it. But don't do it right now. Wait. And I know some people, even under the sound of my voice, who have been waiting. And I wonder how much longer you're going to have the chance to wait. Can I say to you today that our Lord loves you and he wants to spend eternity with you in heaven? You and a whole bunch of other people that have trusted Christ. And it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful time. But unless you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you won't be there. I encourage you today not to listen to the father of all lies. The devil himself knows where he's going. He knows that hell is his doom. He's read the book just like you and I have. And he wants to take as many people as he can with him just so he can jab it in the heart of our Lord who loves you so much. Do you know today you're a sinner? I hope you do because the Bible says we are. And really deep down you know you are too because you're not perfect. Do you know the Lord is your Savior? If you don't, I encourage you today to give your life to him right now in the quietness of this moment. Would everybody bow your head, please? Close your eyes. And if you're here today and you've never received Christ, would you ask the Lord Jesus right now to be your Savior? Give him your life today. Say, I know I'm a sinner, and I know I'm lost, and I need to be saved. I know the Lord died for me on the cross. I know you did. Your blood that you shed was for me, and you put that in your own words. Because you've got to talk to the Lord. I can't do it for you. If I could, I've already done so. But you and your heart need to believe and you need to call on the name of the Lord. Would you do that this morning? Christians, I want to ask you to look at your life as well as we pray. What sin has encroached on your testimony? What deception has Satan rooted in your life that has now got you all out of whack? Caused you to distrust the Lord who loves you so much? and to deny the truth of the word of God. Maybe you need to come today and rededicate. Maybe you need to come today and repent. If you're here and you pray for your...